still today I have patients coming in thinking that they have a chemical imbalance and ask about how is it again with the which, you know, which neurotransmitter. Funny, I actually went yesterday to my books. I just did the board certification test here in Switzerland. So I went to these books, you know, the Bible, it's the style, the essential psychopharmacology. And those still, those still, <laughs> you're laughing. <laughs> I, I read They're all these books still too well. talking about. I know. I think that's what I assumed that uh, there is a serotonin hypothesis that there's decreased serotonin because the drugs increase the serotonin. So, would you talk about that? What you've found? Yeah, this is really important because again, I want to emphasize. I I started out a believer in that story because as a reporter, when I called people up, they said, "Oh, they need these drugs because they fix the chemical imbalance." Talking about the antipsychotics and antidepressants. But what you find when you look into that hypothesis, the hypothesis arises in the 1960s, both the low serotonin or the low monoamine theory and the dopamine hyperactivity theory. But it doesn't arise from investigations or discoveries in people so diagnosed. So it's not that they find people with depression have low serotonin in the 1960s or that people with schizophrenia or psychosis have too much dopamine. What they come to understand is how the drugs act on the brain. So they come to understand that the f first generation of antidepressants, the tricyclics and the monoamine oxidase inhibitors, they up serotonergic activity by keeping serotonin in that synaptic gap between neurons longer than normal. So they hypothesize if the drugs are effective and, and if they do this, maybe the pathology is the opposite of that. And there was the same thing with the dopamine hyperactivity story. Uh, what do antipsychotics do? They block dopamine receptors. They put a break on it. So they hypothesize maybe schizophrenia is due to too much dopamine. Now, once you have that hypothesis, mm -hmm. now you have to trace in the scientific literature the effort to test it because you test hypotheses. And as early as 19, the late 1970s, actually, there was questions being raised about this uh, dopamine hyperactivity theory. And in 1980. Three or 84, the NIMH tested in a big study. The NIMH is the National Institute of Mental Health in the United States. It's the biggest funder of research in the world, the biggest government funder. And they looked to see, do people with depression have abnormal serotonin levels prior to going on the, the medication? And they didn't find it to be so. They basically found that it, with their measurement of metabolites and stuff, it sort of was like a bell curve. And that bell curve was the same as for, you know, normals. And they also found that there was no relationship to where you fell on that bell curve of, of serotonergic metabolites in response to antidepressants. So as 1984, they said, we're just not finding that there's a lesion in the serotonergic system. Now for the next 14 years, they do all sorts of ways to, to look for serotonergic deficiencies. And in 1998, which is how many years ago? 26 years ago, you can read the American Psychiatric Association's own textbook, and it says, we've investigated the monoamine hypothesis of depression, and we just haven't found evidence for it. And then they even say that it was sort of a silly hypothesis from the beginning because there's no reason that the pathology of a disorder should be the opposite of the mechanism of action. So it's really declared dead, the serotonin theory, in 1998. Mm -hmm. But what does the American Psychiatric Association continue to tell people? We now know that depression is a disease caused by abnormalities in the serotonin system and the drugs fix those abnormalities like insulin for diabetes. In the United States, we heard that both from the American Psychiatric Association and from pharmaceutical companies. Now, there's one final sort of irony to this whole story. So in other words, the hypothesis fell apart long ago, but they kept maintaining it. Yeah. They kept telling it to people. Why? Because it, and you know, this is what I asked researchers this once. Why do you tell people this? You know what they told me? Because it gets people to take their drugs. And we know it's like a soundbite to get them to take the drugs. It's very pragmatic. But it's, yeah. And mm -hmm. I just, yeah, but you're not supposed to lie to patients. And it was sort of, well, it's just a little white lie. But that's, that's the long story. I could go in the schizophrenia story, but the story is it was a hypothesis born from understanding the mechanism of action. They didn't find that people with depression had low serotonin before going on the drugs. But the final 
uh, chapter in this story is they did find that once you go on an antidepressant, which interrupts the normal reuptake of serotonin, acting as an accelerator, what does your brain do? It puts down the brake on its own serotonergic machinery, actually dials down its density for serotonergic receptors. So the real irony of this whole story in the scientific literature is that the drugs actually create the very abnormality, hypothesize the cause of the problem in the first place. And then mm-hmm. finally, just to complete right. this story, yeah, you have doctors even saying that's the reason we have such poor long-term. Effect. Right. So it actually ends up uh, down-regulating the receptors, which probably in this hypothesis, they've changed it to there's a decreased number of serotonin receptors. That's right. the that, not that you have low serotonin, but it just you know it doesn't sort of register it. If you, that's right. a nice way to put it. So you're saying that it actually down regulates the receptors and gives exactly. you then withdrawal symptoms if you stay on this drug for a long time. Do you know how long it takes before it starts down regulating these? Actually, it's pretty quick. Its own. It's quite quick. What then the little bit of research that I've seen on this, it, the down regulation happens really quickly. But what happens is it, that initial down regulation triggers all sorts of feedback loops, et cetera, et cetera. And ironically, it's when the feedback loops, it seems, begin to tire out in the presence mm-hmm. of this that you start to get some sort of impact from the antidepressant, say, after six weeks or whatever. But the other thing, what we talking about withdrawal, they said the longer a person is on it, this is from animal research, it seems the mm-hmm. longer it takes for these receptors, if you try to come off, to reset. So then there's a real issue about informed consent in psychiatric patient. I mean, I know uh, I, I wouldn't tell patients about this withdrawal symptoms because I wasn't told. Like, that's not in these books. I checked just recently to have, you know, sometimes you think maybe you forgot, maybe it's there. No, they, they talk about side effects if you stop the medications, which obviously that you have that with several medications. It sounds that's innocent enough. But withdrawal symptoms is not mentioned, and that also makes it impossible to give patients informed consent. What are your thoughts? Yeah, there's been no informed consent. You know, basically what happens, at least in the United States, for the longest time, people would go to the primary care or to their psychiatrist complaining of something, unhappiness or feeling down or whatever. And very quickly, they'd leave with a prescription. And the only information was like, oh, it might take a little while for the drug to kick in. And that was basically it. There was no talk about sexual Mm -hmm. dysfunction. There was no talk about you may have trouble coming off this drug. And so, of course, for the longest time, the profession said, oh, uh, that's just the return of the disease. Those aren't withdrawal symptoms, even though they're so different. So this whole use of these drugs has uh, unfolded in the absence of informed consent, about absence of really how effective they are what they do to your brain, because if you're told they're fixing a chemical imbalance, that's not informed consent. A minimizing of adverse effects, no talk about uh, long-term impact, and also difficulty coming off. So you're making a major decision about your life in the absence of informed consent.